Hey everyone, welcome back. Let's rock on with our rheumatology section. So, <clears throat> what if I gave you a case of a 22 year old young woman presenting with significant pain in her neck, her arms, her elbows, her knees, and she doesn't sleep well, She's, uh, she does not sleep well, right? Pretty non-specific, correct? You have pain everywhere, not sleeping well. You ask her, how's your period? Her menstruation is normal. She has normal menses, normal menses. You do a physical exam, all you find on physical exam is you find tender points, you find tender points on her trapezius, on her medial elbow, on her medial knee, and they are bilateral, all of them. Bilateral, all of them. On labs, you find nothing, nada. Perfectly normal. What's your diagnosis? Your diagnosis is, of course, we all know, fibromyalgia, right? Fibromyalgia, which I know that most of you have learned fibromyalgia is a psychiatric illness, right? Right? Guys, it wasn't too long ago when I was in medical school, and I distinctly remember this, and it stayed tattooed in my brain. I was on rounds in the hospital on my medicine rotation, and we were walking past one of the rooms, and this one woman was admitted, to a young woman, for significant pain. And I distinctly remember the attending saying to us, all right, let's make this quick, let's get in and out, because she has fibromyalgia, she's just crazy, let's go. True story. Many of you have probably experienced the same thing. It's a completely, though, inaccurate statement, and it really pisses me off when I see it, because it's not nice. And if you know people that are dealing with fibromyalgia, it's completely wrong. Is it true that fibromyalgia patients often have associations with psychiatric or psychological traumas? Absolutely. Rape victims, war victims. Is it associated with depression? Yes. And anxiety? Yes. But wouldn't you be depressed and anxious if you were in pain every day of your life? Right? The reason why we were all raised to believe that fibromyalgia is a psychiatric disorder is because back in the day, when they didn't know what fibromyalgia was, which I'll tell you what it is in a minute, what they did was they gave tricyclic antidepressants because they had nothing else to do. Amitriptyline. They gave tricyclics and the patients miraculously got better. So in the 50s and 60s, so oh, that's it, in the 70s. If someone gets better on amitriptyline, that means it's got to be depression. No ass. The problem in fibromyalgia, anyone know what the problem in fibromyalgia is? Now that you guys can answer me. The <laughs> and the money's in here where I mentioned sleep difficulty. The problem in fibromyalgia is what? Is these patients do not go into REM sleep. They have no REM cycling. And because they don't have any REM cycling, their substance P levels, substance P skyrockets. Remember what substance P is? P for pain, as in pain transmission, skyrockets. So now their threshold, their threshold for pain, where normally, for example, mine may be over here, right? So if you touch me, like, why are you touching me, right? But if, it's because my threshold's here. If my threshold's here because of my substance P concentration, you touch me, ow! See the difference? That's what's going on in fibromyalgia. So the underlying mechanism is lack of REM. The reason why tricyclics worked back in the day is because what do tricyclics induce? REM sleep. So substance P levels came down. Wow. <clears throat> Talk about complete misunderstanding. Now, yes, are people that are depressed and anxious, do they have altered REM cycling also? They do, which could be part of the same mechanism. Absolutely. Again, people have been rape victims, war trauma, um, <clears throat> things like that, no question about it. But it's more than just saying, the person's crazy because it's not nice and it's not accurate, right? The tender points that I mentioned here, 
That's what fibromyalgia is famous for, right? Tensor points. But here's the fact of the matter. The fact of the matter is with the new, with the new updated clinical definitions, tender points are not diagnostic anymore. All you need to diagnose fibromyalgia, all you need is pain, recurrent pain syndrome, recurrent pain without an organic explanation. So if you have recurrent pain, multifocal pain without organic cause, you know, no, no rheumatic, no connective tissue disorders, no rheumatic disorders, no trauma, et cetera, et cetera, that's all you need. You define as fibromyalgia. End of story. Done deal. The reason why the tender points occur, they still occur in most patients, but because they were not very accurate, they pulled them from the new definition, but they're still there in many people, is because, if you remember, look at where the tender points are. Trap, medial elbow, medial knee. These are tendon insertion sites. And so therefore, the tendon insertion sites, if you remember, tendons and some have the, something called the Golgi tendon apparatus, which is a sensor for the spine. But because the substance P levels are high and the transmission, the transmission threshold is so low, the slightest tug on those tendons causes pain. Where normally, for me to move my arms up and down, I'm pulling on tendons, but my, my threshold is much higher, so I don't feel pain, I just feel motion. But these people, because their threshold is so low, they feel pain. See the difference? Wow, right? And everyone thinks fibromyalgia is easy. It's not, it's not that simple. Now, how do we treat it? Well, one of the best treatments for fibromyalgia is actually exercise. Exercise and stretch, and specifically stretch exercising. Yoga is phenomenal for fibromyalgia. Yoga, certain, certain martial arts, but any kind of exercise and stretching can, can help fibromyalgia dramatically and I have a lot of patients with it that have gotten much better. Why? Well, the stretching exercises um, mobilizes and alters the tendon, the tendon receptors big time. Also, exercise, this has been shown, people that exercise regularly have better REM cycling than those that do not. That's a fact. And for those of you that work out, you know the days you work out, you always sleep better than the days you don't. It's a fact. So exercise, stretch exercising is a big deal, helps them a lot. Medically, what could we use? Well, I mentioned tricyclics. You could use tricyclics, but now we have better agents that we could use. You could use the GABA agents. You could use the GABA drugs, meaning gabapentin and pregabalin. You could use gabapentin and pregabalin, which alters neurologic transmission. But these days, the drugs of choice are the dual reuptake inhibitors. The dual, the norepinephrine, the norepinephrine the NSRIs and the serotonin, the dual reuptake inhibitors, the NSRIs, dual oxetine, and or venlafaxine. These are the drugs of choice nowadays because they alter transmission yet, increase, yet improving REM cycling, both. Could you use SSRIs? You could. Paroxetine, all those guys too. You could use those as well, uh, but uh, it looks like the data shows the dual reuptake inhibitors are a little better as far as combining both neuro, uh, neurochemical transmission and the REM cycling, all right? So that's fibromyalgia, guys. Again, a little more involved than, than people thought. Now, what if I gave you, or what if I gave you a situation of a 45-year-old woman who is a secretary, I can't spell, she's a secretary, <laughs> secretary complaining of, numbness and tingling of her thumb, index finger, and middle finger. Thumb, index finger, middle finger, right? Pain and tingling, pain, tingling, paresthesias of these three fingers, right? And she's the secretary. Boom, done. What's your diagnosis? This is carpal tunnel, right? Diagnosis here is carpal tunnel syndrome. It's exactly how it presents. And carpal tunnel syndrome is a compression of what? The median nerve. It's a compression of the median nerve, right? So the median nerve comes from, obviously from our neck, from our brachial plexus, coming down our arm, through our forearm, and comes to what's called here the flexor retinaculum, if you remember. It's a little, it's a little band that connects the ulna and the radius over here. And then goes and innervates first three fingers, right? First three fingers. It innervates the flexors, but also sensation of the first three fingers. People that have chronic flexion of the wrist, typing for example, writing often, right, can irritate and tighten up the flexor retinaculum and the wrist area. By doing this, you're compressing the median nerve. And that's why you feel it in your first three fingers, right? How do we treat it? Well, 
Of course, like anything else, you treat conservatively initially. Rest, meaning rest. You could splint. You, you splint, whoops. You splint the hand to keep it neutral to decrease the inflammation, the irritation of the, of the, of the wrist, the flexor retinaculum and the median nerve. That's what you do, right? You could do a steroid injection if that doesn't work. You could do a steroid injection, but that's only, again, that's going to last you three to six months. Then, of course, worst case scenario, if it's really bad, it's not improving, what do you do? You do surgical decompression. But you're not going to operate on everybody. Who, what are the indications of surgical decompression? Basically, if you have severe neurologic deficits, and there's another indication. And remember, it is called thenar atrophy. This is your thenar eminence, right? That's the thenar eminence, right? Thenar atrophy. Okay. So here's your thenar eminence. Here. See how it's beefy? It's actually a pretty big muscle. One of the bigger muscles of the body. Right? Right? <clears throat> See how it's beefy and thick? That's innervated by the median nerve. If this becomes flat and it looks weak and small and it's atrophic, that means your median nerve compression is very significant. Because remember, nerves innervate muscle, musculature, and if you have nerves and nerve compression, muscles become atrophic. That means you have significant severe nerve compression that needs to be decompressed. If you have thenar atrophy, or if you have significant neurologic deficits, paresthesias, complete numbness of, of the fingers, you know, maybe partial paralysis, that kind of thing, you have to decompress as well. All right, that is carpal tunnel syndrome. Now, what else we have? We have something called Dupuytren's contracture, right? Dupuytren's contracture, which will speak for itself. Contracture. So what's Dupuytren's contracture? Right, commonly associated with whom, by the way? Diabetics. Diabetics can get Dupuytren's contracture, right? Dupuytren's contracture, Bishop's deformity, right? Bishop's deformity, Bishop's deformity, Bishop's deformity. That's Dupuytren's contracture. It's also, a fasci it's also a fascial irritation. It's a fascial issue. The putrean contracture is not a neurologic problem. It's a fascial problem. Fascia. The, fa the fascia. It's a fascial issue. Fa fa it's facial irritation. Irritate my face. Facial irritation of the fascia. How do you treat it? Again, like anything else, you start conservative. Rest, you could try splinting. If the contraction is very significant, I've seen it where like fingers are like this, you know, then you need steroid injections. So you can, of course, like anything else, guys, the order is almost always the same for these types of things, right? It's conservative initially, but then you go to steroid injections, and if they're still contracted, surgical decompression of the fascia. They actually cut the bands. There's 500 bands, and they actually cut them. They cut the bands. That's what they do. All right, that's the putrean's contraction. All right, ladies and gents. Rock on. See you soon for the next section.